but yo, thank you for uh, sharing some of your Sunday with us. Um, yeah, and course, we're, we're going to record this so that we can broadcast it out to everyone else over the course of the next few days. But I'm super excited to um, unleash and announce officially the collaboration that uh, you've worked on with us in Stapleverse. And I wanted to just take this episode to, you know, of, of, uh, of this Twitter spaces just to a give some people the background information about you and where you've come from and your journey into the space. And then also how they're going to be able to get one of these um, amazing pieces of work that you've done. Does that sound cool? Yeah, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, so yeah, in a nutshell, my name is Anderson Blue. I'm a graphic designer, also sneaker designer um, based out of New York. Uh, I pretty much cut my teeth getting into design uh, as far as having a clothing brand. So that's how I started learning to become a graphic designer. Didn't go to school for it. I'm self-taught. And all the while, I've just been trying to just improve my game, get better at the whole process and just uh, branding and things like that. And uh, it was two years ago, I got into NFTs. I heard about it through a friend. And to me, it just made sense because I'm a graphic designer. I'm already making digital artwork. So um, mm-hmm. it, it just it was just a natural progression just to make the move to, to do that. What, ye- what year and how long would you say you started in just creating art, period? <laughs> professionally. Uh, not, profession- not, like, not like doodling in your bedroom, course, but like course, your, the first time, yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I would say I, I made the move about like 12 years ago. So like when I was 21, I was like, you know what? I wanted to make that, uh, that push to being a graphic designer. And it's funny because when I made that, when I made that decision, I came up in the world of like, when you had your brand rolling, of course it's still rolling, but you Ben, uh, the hundreds, Johnny cupcakes, like you were the guys that I was looking to when I was, uh, first started a clothing brand. So, um, that's yeah. what really got everything rolling. Well, I, I get asked this question a lot, so I want to I want to ask it of you. Mm-hmm. What is the difference between a graphic designer and an artist? <laughs> I think it de- <laughs> I, I think it depends on the work that you do, right? So, okay, if you're a hired gun for a brand, and they want you to do like uh, design for their websites or branding or marketing. I think that's more of the traditional graphic design that everybody knows. The person that's doing brochure, brochures, business cards, and things like that. But I think when uh, somebody like myself becomes a digital artist that does graphic design is when they're selling artwork that people collect. It could be t-shirts, stickers, and things like that. So I think when you start designing things that people see that's more than just stuff for like, uh, you know, businesses, I think that's when it becomes yeah. like digital artwork. Right. It becomes, it becomes more pure art then at that point. Yes. Yes, correct. Yeah. That's kind of how I feel too. I mean, like artists have the luxury of being able to create um, for the sake of the art, right? Mm-hmm. Like it doesn't matter even if you are a quote unquote artist, but your medium, for example, is like hand-drawn typography or making a zine. Those are sort of like traditional quote unquote graphic design things. Mm-hmm. But if you're doing it just for the sake of the art, then I think you're an artist. I think graphic designers come with, um, a, a sort of responsibility to solve a problem for either like a partner or a client. And like, you know, it's a job of an, of a graphic designer to like better explain a brand or a concept or something like that. Like I, I think graphic designers are problem solvers at the end of the day, whereas artists don't really have to solve a problem. They could just pose a question to society and that's it, you know? Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree to that. And I also think it depends on like what you're doing because some artists who are graphic designers end up doing what you just said, right? Like uh, designing something, but with their brand name on it. So it's kind of like the mixture of both worlds. So I, I, yeah. I definitely get it because it's like a very, very thin line these days. But yeah. In the beginning, was there like, was it a struggle in the beginning or did you sort of just catch a wave right in the beginning? Like what was the early days like for Anderson Blue? I mean, it's, it's still a struggle today, you know, it's, it's definitely never easy. But uh, <laughs> no, no, no. But seriously, though, um, in the beginning, it's definitely tough because when I started, YouTube wasn't really a thing like that. You didn't have Skillshare, you know. Um, uh-huh. I remember when I was thinking about going back to art school because I graduated school for business. Um, a teacher okay. sat me down and she said, before you spend this money, check out this thing called Lynda.com. 
And for people that don't know, uh-huh. Lynda.com is pretty much like Skillshare before Skillshare. Yeah. And uh, I just sat down. I learned as much as I could. Took as many courses for graphic design and learned everything through that. But what made everything tough was just trying to figure it out. You know, when it comes to this art stuff, it's not really a manual that you can follow. You kind of just, you know, put your finger in the air and try to follow wherever the wind takes you. You know what I mean? So that's what I, I remember. Did the, yeah. So, so <laughs> that's what I did for the first 10 years. You know, I. Where'd you I, go I, to for business school? Where'd you go to business? So I went to schools called St. Thomas Aquinas. It's not a big school. It's uh, upstate. In Rockland County, uh-huh. so not too okay. far from the city, but uh, but yeah, but that's but that's where I went. And then where'd you go to art school? I oh, I did not. I decided to. Oh, I went to. I went you to just Google. did the online route. Exactly. I went to Google University, is what I tell people. So uh, <laughs> I just I just learned as much as possible, and uh, and that was it. That's dope. So you're self taught. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Nice. I've I've been hearing a lot of people learn on like Google University or or Skillshare, you know, university, but that's that's just amazing cuz I had, you know, even before you in my era it was like there was none of that stuff, so you really had to get your foot in the door at an art school and build a portfolio and and start there. Yeah. Um do you remember the first time you actually got like a check and money for your art? Um I do. I, I mean, yeah, I do. I, I feel like the one that stood out to me the most was like my first check from Foot Locker. That one was like, okay. I need to hang this one up. So take take us through it. Take us yeah, through yeah, that yeah. story. So to make a long story short, um, so I started to do my sneaker artwork. It's been two years. And I get an email from Foot Locker, and they say, "Hey, we like what you're doing. Want to know? Would you be interested in do maybe a collaboration?" So I'm like, "Of course, it's Foot Locker. Why not? I grew up on it." So I go down to their uh, one of their stores to meet one of the managers, and I'm bringing my artwork, and he's telling me, like, hey, we might have a collaboration with G.I. Joe. Um, we want to know, is that something that you're interested in, something that you grew up on? And as I'm showing him my artwork, the workers are looking at it like, oh, what's this? Oh, where can I get this? And he okay. saw the energy from the people. He's like, you know what? We want you to be a part of this. So when I did this G.I. Joe collaboration... It was only for like t-shirts. That was it. Just wanted me to do a few uh, t-shirt designs and that was it. But as I was doing the artwork, I got an email and they said like, hey, Asics wants to be a part of it, but one of their designers, he just doesn't have the flexibility to do it. Can you, Mm -hmm. like, would you be interested in doing the sneaker design for this collaboration? (laughs) And then me, so the, the way I was thinking about it was like, I already signed the contract as far as payment goes and everything like that. I could, one say, oh, I want to get paid to do the sneaker, or number two, I can not say anything, do the best sneaker I can possible and have it on my resume. So I decided to mm-hmm. go with option two because, you know, um, me growing up, I don't know how you get the opportunity to do sneakers. So for me, it's like if somebody's going to give you the opportunity, I'm going to take and make the most of it. So um, And you didn't want to jeopardize the whole project by exa- like exactly. sounding greedy. Exactly. Right. So... Um, literally that's a big that's a big lesson that's a big lesson man that's that was kudos to you thank you thank you i actually because some some people will say like oh you know you got taken advantage of but like this was your first sneaker right and Mm -hmm. your first big company project so Mm -hmm. you're right like let's say let's say you stood your ground great kudos to you and then they said you know what thanks we're gonna call somebody else exactly that opportunity now transpires but now that's a feather in your cap you know no Mm -hmm. pun intended that you can like now used to build like you've done you know on and on and on from there so that's amazing and the way and it's funny you should say that because the way that i saw it was there's no amount of money that they could have paid me that would have matched the, the amount of marketing or the placement on my resume of doing sneakers so it's just like so i'm gonna ask and foot locker extra, yeah exactly extra five thousand dollars but i'd rather just do the sneaker <laughs> you know so yeah. Sorry. Um, so yeah, that must've been a, that must've been a very like gratifying moment to all the, um, the hesitation that you might've had about pursuing this as a career choice. Yeah, it was definitely, it was definitely one of those pinch yourself moments. I'm not going to lie to you, but it's funny you say that because what they said to me was like, just a heads up as far as Foot Locker goes, A6 is not a big seller for us. So if this actually does (laughs) well, yeah, exactly. So he's like, so this actually does well like there are probably more opportunities so you know uh-huh. no pressure but let's see what you can do with it 
So yeah. I went down to the headquarters, designed both sneakers in a day, knocked them both out, went home. Wow. And uh, yeah, they went, they put it out, and it became one of the best selling ASICs in like Foot Locker history. That's dope. Yeah. That, that's almost like relieving because they were like, they don't traditionally do well for us. So you're probably like, damn, I, there's no, there's no else to go but up on this one. Like it'd be different if like they were like, yo, every Air Jordan one we've done sold out. So now here you go. You do one now. <laughs> it's right, like, right. damn, that, then the pressure's on, you know? Yeah. No, you're right. That pressure would have been crippling. But, uh, but that, 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 that's, that's, that was the story of my first check. Wow. That's really dope. Um, did you have like, um, support from you know talk about like family support loved ones your your crew like did you have like a good support system for pursuing this career choice um i'm gonna say yeah it was definitely difficult because um my family's from the caribbean i'm trinidadian so my parents Mm. were born there so for them it's education over everything which i totally understand and i definitely get it but for me school didn't didn't come naturally for me so when i came to them with this idea of i be a graphic designer to them. They will be nervous about it because they don't know much about the career. You know, like they were definitely stuck in the very stereotypical artists don't make money. And I definitely get that. But after they saw that, you know, I was spending more than a year doing it, I was really trying to make it happen. They gave me all the support in the world and just tried to like, you know, keep me positive and keep me, you know, keep that ball rolling. That's dope. That's good. Because I know a lot of people in the art space, um, either traditionally or in Web3, and even people who are just into Web3 or even people who are like even just collecting NFTs for that matter. There's a, especially in this day and age, there's a lot of like naysaying or player hating, if you will, you know. <laughs> so I always like to ask that question because I'm sure, you know, um, I, I don't know if you still get this, like when you say you're releasing an NFT project, like do people still say like, oh, you're still into that like Ponzi scheme BS? <laughs> like do you still have haters there? Um, some people, some people like will ask me like, hey, what's going on with the NFT space? Because of everything that's in right. the news. But as far as that goes, I think everybody's on the same understanding because what I do is just artwork. Like I'm not pitching any anything else other than that, right? So, you know, if people bought my art prints, they understand that they get in the NFT and it comes with special editions that come with it. So it hasn't been too tough, thankfully. And I, and, and I think the reason for that is, is because I've been doing it for so long that I feel like I have that trust for the people that uh, mm-hmm. buy my artwork. Mm-hmm. When So before we get into Web3, your mm-hmm. artwork, like, what were you selling? How are you sort of uh, making money. It's, it sort of sounds like you were doing corporate collaborations, mm-hmm. products, sneakers. Were you selling prints, paintings? Like break down how you were. People were accessing Anderson Blue before NFTs. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, okay. So what I do is every month I release a limited edition art print. It usually revolves around sneakers, pop culture, or or sports. So what happens is like. I'll either go to like a show, like a sneaker con or a different like show, like a designer con showcasing my artwork to let people know what I'm doing. And then uh, they pretty much sign to my email list and they buy the artwork once a month. But the reason why I got into it was because I felt like there was a lack of representation for people who are into sneakers like me and you. Um, I would go to shows and I would literally see like this, like somebody would paint a sneaker on a canvas and that would be it. Just like a regular sneaker. And I always said to myself that like, I wish there was somebody, I wish somebody would tell a different story, you know, because I always like to see mm-hmm. artwork. So, um, so that's what I did. And I just slowly grinded from there. Uh huh. Wow. Cool. And so, um, were the, were the prints like limited edition runs or something like that? Like how would you yeah. determine? Yeah. The print run? yeah. So it, so it all revolves around the story I'm trying to tell. So for example, if I did a Michael Jordan print, it would be like the number would be like 23. If I did a Kobe print, mm-hmm. it'd be like the number eight. So it all depends Uh, on the kind of story I'm trying to tell with that art print. So all the numbers vary. But what I do is once that print sells out, I don't reprint it. I just move on to the next one. And I just tell people, I treat it it like a sneaker drop. So you have to, so once I make that announcement, you have to be there to get it. If not, you're probably not going to get it after that. Cool. Cool. And I I feel like a, a parent asking this next question, but (laughs) (laughs) so this is how you make your living right now. Like your full time, you're a full-time working artist now? 
Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's like you're, it was like the parents was like, "You're eating well. Are you, you got enough food in the fridge?" Like, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I'm lucky enough to where you know this is the full time thing. Um, pretty much to make a long story short, while I was building Anderson Blue, um, my dad was a police officer, retired, opened a tax office. And uh, I joined that just to keep an eye on it, just to learn about taxes. So I have a really strong background in accounting. Um, Smart. About four years ago, unfortunately, uh, my dad passed away. So he, so unfortunately, he never saw any of this stuff happen as far as the sneakers and everything oh. that's going on now. But after he passed, I took over the business and I've been pretty much juggling both. Um, and this year is the year where I scale back the business to where we just do remote because Anderson Blue has grown so much that it literally needs all my attention. So I am full time into this. Wow, dude, your your dad is proud from above. I'm telling you, like in in the 25 years I've been doing this and the th tens of thousands of people I've met, I have never met an artist who also runs an accounting <laughs> tax preparing company. And that is a first. Yeah, Man. I'm, happy, I'm happy to hear that. Because usually artists are known for like being knuckleheads when it comes to their finances and taxes. That's that uh, the immigrant mindset. Because there's no way my my <laughs> my family would be okay with that. So, so I assume like you do your own books, like you balance your own finance finances, right? Um, I have a company that does it. So, like, because okay, so bookkeeping could be a very very yeah. tough task. So I have people yes. that do it, but I oversee everything. And Oof. I know how to do my own Gangster. Taxes. Yeah. <laughs> I know how to Gangster. do business taxes, okay, wait. open businesses and we, all that other fun stuff. <laughs> we got to switch gears on this talk then because I didn't even know this, this part about your brain. But when people listen to this, there's going to be a lot of creatives whose number one headache and gripe is balancing the books, dealing mm -hmm. with taxes, you know. What is like just off the top, you know, mm -hmm. like what are some of the biggest mistakes or biggest things to look out for in the financial realm of being a working creative? I think the OK, so the first thing a creative should do two things, actually, you should definitely get somebody to do your books. If you tell me that you're doing it on your own, oh. I can promise you you're doing it wrong. These days you can get <laughs> <laughs> just so these days you could uh, get a company that you want to sit in front of. They, they'll work remotely mm -hmm. and they'll do your books, keep mm -hmm. everything organized uh, for like a really affordable price. So that's number one. Definitely mm -hmm. do that. And then number two is I would either get yourself an EIN number or open up uh, LLC for your company. Just because what you want to okay. do is you want to take advantage of all the expenses, all the money that you're spending as far as running your brand, right? Even using your cell phone because you because your uh, tape and content is an expense. Yeah. So yeah, paying for paint brushes, like all of that exactly. is now an expense. So if you don't open up an LLC, right, and get an EIN mm -hmm. number, which is just like, you know, your business tax number, you're not gonna be able to take advantage of it. So once you do mm -hmm. that, and you have it as a business, so rather than, so we put it this way, right? Um, when you make money from, let's say you work at Target, right? You get paid after the taxes, right? When you yep. run your own business, you pay taxes after your expenses. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. I know it's pretty confusing, but yeah. what I'm saying is you're able to, re so you end up paying less in taxes if you're able yep. to do everything I, the I, right way. I know I'm breaking really it down the way. Words. My, my, no, this is, this is knowledge, dude. This is what people need to hear. Like, and I'll, I'll break it down the way. My, financial advisor who i i had to pay money to I'm, I, unfortunately i'm not blessed with anderson's like just <laughs> innate knowledge of finance but let, let's say you make ten thousand dollars in a year right mm -hmm. you're going to get taxed on that ten thousand you're going to get taxed on 10k now if you spent a thousand dollars on paint supplies you can write that off when what write that off means is instead of saying to the government i made ten thousand you can say to the government i made nine thousand and you're going to pay tax on the nine versus mm -hmm. the 10, which mm -hmm. means you pay less tax. And that's yep. totally legal. And in fact, you could do it to meals, lunches, dinners, mm -hmm. trips, hotels, car rent. Like you could write off a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. part of your rent, probably, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so if you think about that 10K example going down to like damn near 6K and it's mm -hmm. the difference between paying tax on 
10K versus 6K, now you're really talking. So um, there's also a huge advantage um, about having an EIN, like Anderson said, and, and forming an LLC from a, from a liability standpoint, meaning like if you're just sort of making money and people are writing checks directly to you personally, if you ever, God forbid, get into some sort of like litigation or lawsuit, Mm-hmm. The, the person suing you can go after you personally for everything you own, like every single thing you own. Whereas if you have a company, you're shielded by the LLC and the EIN. They can only go after the LLC and the mm-hmm. company. They can't go after you personally. So that's another benefit of, of having a company. Yeah, exactly. And then, wow. you know, it's turned take- into Marcus Lemona's <laughs> Shark Tank. <laughs> exactly. it's, it's a lot easier to, to claim bankruptcy on a company than, you know, so might take all yeah. the money from your savings and 401ks and all the yep. other stuff. Yep. Yep. College fund, baby formula money. Like they can take everything. But if you yep. have the company, you could just close down the company and, and keep it moving, you know? Yes. Um, dope. Wow. Did not know that. That is amazing. And so now you're sort of like in the midst of pursuing like it sounds like you're you're more full time on the art and you're winding down the accounting business. Yeah, exactly. It's just um you know, you know how it is when you see lightning is a strike twice and you know, when yeah. there's a lot of momentum happening and I see it happening. So I would be silly to um, disappear for five months to do tax and come back to do the art. So um, it, it just, <laughs> yeah. right now it just makes total sense. Like this is what I need to do at this moment. I but, will say as a fallback business idea, mm-hmm. man, doing taxes for creative artists is a massive business. Probably. I, <laughs> Trust me, I've thought about it. I have a hundred percent thought about it. But one of the things I'm going good, to be it's doing a fallback. is uh post content for creatives about stuff like this on my YouTube channel. Oh dope. Sick. Excellent. All right. So uh something starts to happen, right? We we've seen the advent of the blockchain, web three, crypto, and then NFT starts to come into into the picture. Um obviously lots of people now know what they are, but rewind back the clock a little bit and take us back to the first time you ever heard of it. And I want to know your initial impressions on NFTs right when you first heard about it. And then what finally made you jump in? So I, so I first heard about NFTs when we were all on lockdown, like right after the NBA canceled the season and everything like that. Um, I started hearing a little bit about it, but I didn't really understand it. Um, And to be honest, at first I just couldn't, understand why a person would want to buy digital artwork where they could just have something to hang you know and then i became privy to the technology um as soon as i learned that like it was a new way of creating artwork it just brought me back to you know what this sounds really familiar to graffiti and tattoo artwork and when i say that Mm -hmm. when these things first happened people poo-pooed it and said this is not real art this is just you know D- just the side thing that's not as important but if you fast forward to, if you fast forward today they look they looked at as like the finest art so it just it, so pretty much yeah. NFT just reminded me of that but um, cool that's a good analogy you're right but just seeing what people were doing NFTs you know what you're doing what Bobby Hunter was doing um, I just saw it as like a new way it's like a new customer experience you know as far as doing yep. the airdrops and really connecting with your customer and just adding a different layer towards the customer experience. And that's what really brought me into it. Because for me, mm-hmm. it's like, how can I? So like I was saying to you before, when I sell my artwork, it sells out. I don't bring it back out. But what happens now if that artwork allows you to pair with an NFT so you know it's me, and then you're able to do trades with other people and feel safe about it. So as soon as that hit me, I was like, yeah. oh, my God, this is almost like Beanie Babies in a way. So yeah. it just made sense to slowly to start to build and start to get into it. And when that moment happened for you, did you already have some crypto you were dabbling or you were totally new to the whole thing? Um, so I probably spent two months in crypto before I started doing the NFTs. So okay. it was brand new. So I was very, very new. new. Very new. And h- how did you learn? Um, podcasts back to Google University once again, you know, <laughs> just trying to get yeah. as much information as possible. Yeah. Yep. And then do you uh, take us through to your first um, NFT drop? Yeah. So my first NFT drop is a part of a series called my Sneaker Transformation Series, which looks very close to what we did for our upcoming drop. 
pretty much what I do is yep. I take, put my own spin on some of my favorite sneakers, try to tell a story through it. So if it's something like the Bart Simpsons, I might try to find a cross between a Nike SB and Bart Simpson. And then what I'll do is when you buy it, you get like hidden content. The hidden content could be a one-on-one print or what I did when one of my sneakers dropped in August. If you bought the NFT, you got free sneakers to go with it. So I try to make it fun. Try to make it like an Easter egg hunt. Yeah. Um, you recently did a big V Friends collaboration, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Right? Yes, yes, yes. How the, how, I mean, Gary Vaynerchuk is the, is pretty much like one of the biggest names in the space and even in just media in general. How did mm-hmm. that collaboration transpire? Um, there's a funny story behind that one. So I was actually, in, uh, he doesn't know this either. So this is like breaking news. Okay. I was, actually, <laughs> I was actually in the delivery room with my wife because I just I now have a baby girl. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, wow. Uh, in the delivery room, he shoots me a DM. He's just like, hey, man, see what you're doing. Keep grinding. Keep doing your thing. So as my wife is going through the process, I'm like, hey, I know it's probably not the time, but Gary V just sent me a DM. Like, is it okay if I take a quick call? So um, Wait, wait, wait. Why, wait, Gary V sent you a DM while you're at the hospital. Correct. But, correct. Congratulating you on your work or on the pregnancy? Oh, yeah. <laughs> on, on my work. He had no idea. Nobody knew. That. Wow. No okay. Idea. So the timing was just crazy. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so you're telling your wife who's like breathing in contractions, yep. like, uh, can I take this call? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably not the best moment, but you know, we had plenty of time. She understood. And then we just talked for a little bit, you know, he just said, um, you know, I see what you're doing. I like how you're putting out content for the art world and stuff like that. And then he said, Hey, there's an opportunity for us to work together. Like, you know, I'll let you know. And then ironically, a few weeks later, the uh, he told me he's going to Designer Con uh, to help promote his V-Friend project. And he was interested in me doing a, a collaboration shirt. And, you know, I've been following Gary for a minute. So I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. So I just took one of his, uh, for people who don't know, his V-Friend project. He has like, oh, I think it's like 188 characters. And the way mm-hmm. I see it, it's almost like he's building his own Disneyland with his own properties. So yep. I took, so I took one of the characters called the kind warrior and put my own spin on it. Um, I really resonated with the character because it's like a person that hustles to get things done, but they're not trying to be a jerk while doing it, you know? So um, yeah. I, I pretty much made it look like a super Nintendo character. And then we just did a limit limited edition drop at designer con. I think we did like a hundred shirts and it was dope. It was great. It was great to meet his community. And it really showed me, it was like, Oh, this community stuff is real because he, even though yep. he wasn't there, it was great to, to meet the people that like uh, his holders. And the funny thing is I felt like, well, I guess on my end, it would almost be like Gary Vee's friends. That's like the personalities I came like that I <laughs> interacted with. Like everybody was super yeah. sweet. Everybody was kind and everybody was like very entrepreneurial. So it was cool. Yep. Yeah. And so when was that? When did he reach out? AKA when did you have your kid? I guess. Okay. Same time. <laughs> uh, September 15th. Wow. So, and designer con was just, Two weeks ago, right? Uh, yeah. So it was a very, so very it was like turnaround. three months, like yeah, ninety days for the whole thing, from first phone call to launch. Yeah, I've I've learned, and I'm sure you know this. You know, sometimes these projects move faster than you would want them to, but it's got to hit that deadline. It is what it is. Well, specifically in the Web three space, I find projects move at lightning speed compared to Web two world. Right, right, right. right. Don't definitely. Like I'm. Sh- I'm sure the Foot Locker, like, do you remember how long the Foot Locker A6 project took from beginning to end? Um, Probably like a year and a half. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's it's not even comparable. And I mean, I'll, I'll tell you real quick my, my Gary V story, because we also collaborated with V Friends. Okay. And he posted one of his characters is called the Persuasive Pigeon. He actually has two pigeons in his collection, Persuasive Pigeon and Perspective Pigeon. Okay. And so he did a post on it uh, on IG. And I like mad people were tagging me and like at adding at me, you know? And so I looked and I left a comment and I said, should at staple pigeon meet at persuasive pigeon. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and he immediately gives the, uh, the hmm emoji, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like the hand on the chin and then DMS right away. And within 10 minutes, we're on a FaceTime video. And it's just go, go, go from that point on, you know, and we ended up doing a, a merch drop collection, a, a tea, a hat uh, and a hoodie. 
Um, and it's just, it's incredible to see someone like Gary, who is like operating on so many levels at such a elevated stage about how like he still is the one who personally dm you. He's still the one who FaceTimed me. Like he's still so hands-on with everything. It's really inspirational. Yeah, no, I agree. Cause just like what you said, you wouldn't think most people would be doing it that way, but you know, it's, it's mm-hmm. good to see that he practices what he preaches. He's really, you know, in the dirt trying to make it happen. Yeah, exactly. So this is a good segue because now we have a collaboration coming. Mm-hmm. And for, for those who, who don't know, um, you know, Stapleverse is a project that we started this year, and there's a, a few different groups within Stapleverse. It started out with the Feed Clan, which is a, a, a group of 20 different foods that a New York City grimy pigeon might might find in its beak, you know. And then people were able to toss that and get try to either get a pigeon or they might get pooped on. And so this particular collaboration that we're doing revolves around the poop gang, which is like really one of the most interesting groups that we have because they really operate like as a group together. They form community collective decision-making together, which is really cool. Um, And so what we wanted to do to empower them is create a really unique collaboration uh, just for them and, you know, we could have done like a, a just another merch drop or create something really cool just for them. But we decided to bring in some fresh blood, a.k.a. you, to help <laughs> conceive and, and concept something. And even the way it's released is super cool. So, first of all, when I, I know Lemon is the is the connectant from the Stapleverse community that was able to to make the connect with you and bring you in. But when you first heard about this opportunity and the brainstorming started to begin, Tell me what was like churning in your head as, as you were thinking about like the start of this project. Uh, first, I was very excited. You know, you're a New York lo- legend. So as far as I'm concerned, it was I was going to make it happen uh, no matter what. But uh, when we had the conversation, it was just like, what could we do to get the poop gang excited? You know, something that something that will tie into your roots of sneakers and also the brand. And, you know, let me point it out that he thought the sneaker transformation series would be perfect, you know, just mm-hmm. taking um, the what the dunk design and taking some of the elements and then adding it to the to the pigeon. And I thought it made sense, especially because, um, you know, how it is with Web3. Um, I just felt like the what the dunk matched the idea of Web3 as far as you have so many different patterns, you have so many different details. And if you could take that and add it to the pigeon. I just felt like it would organically work. And that's what we did. We just tried yep. to match those elements as much as possible just to give something cool that people would either want to have in their digital wallet or, you know, have on their wall. Yeah. And for those who don't know, the reason why the What the Dunk was chosen is because the Poop Gang actually has in its vault a physical Nike SB What the Dunk sneaker, a real one in its vault that it won in a raffle that we conducted earlier in the year. It was it was so it's on my IG uh, reels, but like we did a whole raffle and the the entire poop gang had a ticket in that raffle and we pulled that one to win the the what the dunk. So like they actually own it. And down the line in the future, we're actually going to let the entire poop gang decide what they want to do with the what the dunk. So that's why we decided to make that the muse of this collaboration. Yeah. And what's cool about this is is also not only is there going to be a digital artwork component from Anderson Blue on this, but there's also going to be the ability to make and claim a a physical print of that, too. So you can have something in your wallet, but also something on your wall and go back to the roots of of both Anderson and I's career in the beginning, where it started out with physical art and physical objects. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. No, I was just saying, I, I just think it's cool because like meeting of both worlds, right? So it's like, you know, if you want traditional artwork, you can get that. But if you're trying to get into Web3, this is a good reason to do that where you now have something in your wallet, you have something in your home. Yes, exactly. Um, the other thing is what we found that's, a, you know, that's playing into this collaboration, which is pretty cool, is we found a lot of people in Poop Gang have multiple poops. They have more than one. Some have like two, three, four. Some even have more than 10. And some people have like crazy amounts, like 50 or something like that. Um, So what we wanted to do is figure out a way to empower people who had more than one and sort of create like different tiers, if you will. Uh, It's kind of like 
like if you fly a particular airline a lot, like you get more perks because you fly more with the airline kind of thing. So we actually uh, worked with you to create four different iterations of this illustration, right? So you did mm -hmm. four really dope different versions of this. Um, and I could break it down real quick, but I'd love to hear from your perspective, like the differences in complexity between these four. And while we're doing this, Lumi, who's um, overseeing the Stapleverse account right now for us, she's going to start um, tweeting out the actual images and, and sort of what you need to get each one. So there's, there's a one, a three, a five, and a 10 level, meaning if you have one staple versus poop nft you're eligible for this blue background one if you have three or more uh you're eligible for a blue background with a cloud if you have five or more you get a blue cloud with graffiti version and then if you have 10 or more you have the most limited which is a blue cloud with graffiti and a tearing effect so you want to break down those uh four pieces and, and the differences between them while, yeah, yeah. while lumi posts them yeah, definitely. So just like what you said, we wanted to really reward people with the more the more NFTs that they have. So for the first one is it's I won't even say it's like a general design, but it's probably the simplest form that we have. And that's one with the blue background with a few patterns from the what the dunk sneaker. And then we move on to the next one, the one with the clouds. It starts to. So let me take a step back. So when I try to do this, I try my best to tie it to New York. So for this one, I'm just mm -hmm. like, obviously, pigeons fly. So to have a really cool sky background, um, I thought that made a whole lot of sense. And then also um, changing up the look of the pigeon by adding different materials to it. Because my whole goal for this is I wanted to have, so I wanted people to, so let's say if they have more than one NFT, I wanted them to see the difference between version one for five, for eight, and so on. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, so for the third one, um, which, which is the one that has the graffiti, which has like the tear. So it's part graffiti, part pigeon. So I got mm -hmm. that idea is because, you know, I'm from New York. I grew up on seeing graffiti everywhere. And anytime I do these designs, I like to leave like little Easter eggs. It's, this one probably has my favorite. Um, so I was telling people that if you look really, really close on the graffiti side, it actually spells something, actually spells out staple. So I thought that was a mm -hmm. cool little, uh, you know, nod t towards the brand. And I thought people yep. would really find that interesting. And then for the last one is literally like, to me, it's like my process because everything I do, I do by hand and I draw it out on paper and then it goes mm -hmm. into, uh, you know, Adobe illustrator and I bring it to life from there. And then mm -hmm. it go, and then I added the graffiti effect. But the reason why I did all three pieces is because it just ties back to what the dunk, right. As far as having different materials and different things and binding them together so yeah yeah and the other cool thing is that if you have like let's say um if you have like let's say seven poops for example mm -hmm. you not only get the third tier but you also get the second and the you get all of the tiers mm -hmm. below you know so if you have 10 or more you actually get all four which is really mm -hmm. cool it's not just the one because we've done drops where like we've actually released exclusive tiers and the people who get the exclusive one are like, we actually want the general one. <laughs> and oh. They're like, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> it's almost like if you get upgraded to first class, they're like, no, but we want to sit coach also. <laughs> right, right, right. It's like, all right. <laughs> you know. Um, so, yeah, so we, we definitely opened this up where, like, if you're at a high tier, you get all the tiers below the tier that you're in. So that's pretty cool, too. Um, and then, you know, one thing that I, one other thing that I wanted to communicate is that it, um, when the claim opens, right, the only way to guarantee that you're going to get the physical print is to hold that poop long enough so that it qualifies um, for an airdrop that's going to happen. So those the the NFT digital version of the artwork that we just explained, it's just going to be airdropped to your wallet. We're going to be able to on the back end figure out how many poops you have and then airdrop the right NFT by Anderson Blue into your wallet. Um, and so. You know, just because if you if you think you can buy the Anderson Blue NFT alone, that won't be enough. You actually need the poops as well, you know, which sounds so weird to say that. But <laughs> you, you do need you need the poops to be able to get in on the action. You can't just buy the Anderson Blue NFT. Um, and so the other thing that we wanted to do is um we, we're trying to experiment here. And this is what's really cool about Web3. If you've been in NFTs for long enough, you'll know that there's this concept of like 
a snapshot or or a timestamp of like at this exact day at this exact time whatever you have in your wallet is what's going to be counted right um and what that does is it creates like a bum rush for people to buy um and it also creates like potentially gas wars and traffic and tech issues too so what i wanted to do uh as an experiment for this one is say and announce that what we're going to do is we are targeting early this week. So sometime in the first half of this week, we are going to take a snapshot internally and everyone who has poops in their wallet, X number of poops, depending on how many you have, we're going to lock in on that time and day. And then we're going to reward people and do the airdrops at that moment. But we're not going to publicly announce that time. And that way, you guys can just casually, whether after you hear this tonight, tomorrow, um, you should get on it, you know, sooner rather than later. But that way there isn't this bum rush for the door and gas prices spiking and everything like like this huge. We just didn't want to create that like hype circle. And, and frankly, we wanted to just more so reward those who already have the poop right now and have just been sitting on it and waiting for a moment like this to happen versus like all these new Johnny come lately said, like, oh, I'll pay you whatever you want for your poop right now. You know, like we wanted to reward the people who who've been holding on for this long. Um, so we're kind of trying to uh, a more casual approach versus like a public timestamp approach. That's awesome. That's dope. Yes. Yes. I can't, I can't um, wait to see this unveil. Yeah. Um, Lemon also wrote up a beautiful medium post that breaks down not only all of the specifics of this drop, but also all of the background information leading up to this drop. Um, so if uh, Stapleverse account, Lumi, if you could put that medium post in as well, that'd be awesome. Um, yeah, but yeah. Into the very first is the very first pin tweet. Dope. Thank you so much, Lumi. Um, Anderson, man, this has been so much fun to, to work on with you. Um, you are an incredibly talented artist that's got an amazing trajectory going forward. And you're going to be able to do everyone's taxes when you blow up. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be calling you to do my financial books eventually one day. Um, hey man, do you have any, any last shout outs you want to give any or, or questions you want to uh, say to the audience? Um, just thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I definitely appreciate it. You know, um, especially, you know, it's great to see people like yourself, to work with you know new upcoming artists and to give them an opportunity like this and you know words can't describe how much i appreciate it and you and lemon and the whole uh staple verse that's uh helped to make this happen so thank you thank you, you man I, i'm looking forward to meeting in real life in the city sometime um actually lumi just gave me a heads up that we might have some questions oh they might have disappeared it, it, yeah lumi do we have any questions from the audience that we want to field we had a few people who requested questions, but they just they just disappeared. However, I myself have a question for you, Anderson. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So real quick. Um, five, 10, 15 years from now, what do you see yourself doing in the NFT space? And what is your artwork doing to people, for people? Oof. That is a tough question. Um the way that I see it is just at the end of the day. Okay, so whenever it comes to the the milestones for me, it's just me just trying to better my business and just try to grow it. So when I say that, just not only doing artwork, but also turning into like an agency to where I could create content to help the new artists coming up and, uh, and doing things like that. So as far as the NFTs and the artwork, I'm just focused on just try to grow that, how to help the new person coming up and just try to show them that, hey, if you don't want to do traditional artwork, NFTs might be the thing because it might be more cost effective. You might be able to break in through a different avenue. And I think that's very, very important. Because like what I said to you before, um, there's a lot of art mediums that people didn't think would be as popular as they are today. So, you know, you never know who might be the next Jeff Staple or or somebody else as far as like you're able to like show them how they can make that possible. Love that. Love that. One more question. If, okay. If you were going to be able to speak to somebody who is like yourself when you're 12 years old, right. Um, just mm -hmm. getting started in their career, not really sure about themselves quite yet. What advice would you give them? 
Um, I would tell them to try everything. Try everything and be open-minded, you know. Be, flex- be flexible like a bridge. Um, you know, when I was coming up, I didn't really have a game plan of what I wanted to do. But um, I think the thing that made the biggest difference was I wasn't super romantic about how things needed to be. I would see the opportunity. I try to make the best out of it and just see and just see what happens. Sometimes things work. Sometimes they don't. But, you know, as a younger person, is I, I still suffer with this now, is you're always worried about failing. And when you worry about failing, sometimes you might not try things. But when it comes to things not working out, I almost look at it like a lesson. Like, okay, this didn't work, but what do I know now? I'm like, well, I know not to do that again. Or maybe I should try this. Or maybe I should try this angle. And I think that's very, very important, just being super open-minded and just try a little bit of everything. That was great. That was great. Thank you. Um, any other requests? Lumi? I think Levin just hopped up here. Yeah, let's Lemon. Yeah, what's going what's going on? What's going on? Sorry, I uh I still I still have lost my voice a little bit. Don't know what happened. It's just gone. Um but uh it's it's fine. I got I got the, I got two of the people that I, I joke I talk to more than my own brother sometimes. Um <laughs> so I had a question for Anderson and uh just a reminder for everybody. So if you are in the fourth tier, uh and you get that that print that is that has the tear on it. Uh, Anderson Blue is going to be hand embellishing those prints. So if you've got if you've got ten poops or more, you're going to be basically getting a one of one, uh, you know, embellished version Ooh. of of that print, as Wait, well as the other ones that we're that doing. Blue? Did you know that blue? <laughs> I did, but it definitely slipped my mind. So thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the question that I had and uh, was, uh, you know, what kind of uh, what kind of things have you have you might have been thinking about doing as embellishments on there, or you know, what where do you think that that goes? Um, so as far as the embellishment, uh, it really comes down to there's a few things I'm thinking. Um, either something to tie into like you know my own character, like I have a character called Benji the Cat. So I'm thinking about maybe doing like a quick hand drawn uh, version of him on there or maybe drawing some poop on there. So I have a few ideas that I'm playing with to make it really fun. And I also think that if I do draw a poop, right, what's cool about it is everyone, every one of those would be totally different. So it really feels like it's a one of one. So um, for me, Crazy. just trying to design something so the person feels like this is a one of one, this is a one of one artwork that they won't be able to get from anywhere else. So. Oh, this is going to be amazing. That's awesome. I appreciate yeah. that. And, uh, I, I do want I do want to add though, okay? If, if if anybody in the audience is one of those people that like qualifies for that for that highest version, and you're gonna get the uh, that that hand embellished tweet uh, print, if you don't share it with the rest of us so we can see how it turned <laughs> out, like I'm gonna be pissed. Seriously. Like I need to see them all. Seriously, As everybody. I mean, w- once you get the airdrop coming this week, uh, tag me, tag Stapleverse, tag Anderson Blue, uh, and hashtag Poop Gang. Poop Gang's in the house on this one strong, so um, we want to see all the amazing art that you guys get. And and then, you know, when you get the in-real-life print, we want to see it in your in your apartment or studio also. Absolutely. I can't wait to see yeah. it. Super excited. Well, Blue, thank you again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you have your Sunday back uh, so you can watch some football or something. Um, but <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for hopping on, and thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you, Lumi. Thank you, Lemon. Uh, this is an amazing win for the poop gang. Um, and I can't see, I can't wait to see how everyone reacts to this. It's going to be so dope this week.